Oh, hi there. This is Mr. Weiss. You, you caught me doing another lesson for our unit. This is our last unit in unit six. So we've covered in this unit quite a bit. We've gone over the confidence intervals for both one and two sample proportions. We've also done hypothesis tests for one and two sample proportions. It's a lot of a lot of work crammed into one unit. But today we're going to be talking about what is what does it all mean? You know, what what happens if we make a mistake? How strong is our test? How powerful is it? All that should be answered in today's lesson. So grab a pen, find page 25 through 28 of your notes. Make sure you have your TI calculator in front of you so we can calculate some of this stuff. And let's begin. All right, I want you to read through this little blurb here talking about Wolverine Worldwide, a shoe company in Rockford. Question says, the Wolverine Worldwide, a shoe company in Rockford, improperly disposed of chemicals, PFAS, which have leaked into the groundwater. The state of Michigan, Michigan, hey, says that if more than 7% of households in a city exceed the safe limit, the city needs to switch to bottled water. A concerned citizen takes a random sample of 100 households and find that 12 have unsafe water. Do the data provide convincing evidence that Rockford should switch to bottled water? So here's what we got, okay? You think about this problem and you look at what is our default, right? Well, 7% is your null, right? That's our baseline. That's our starting amount. So when we're talking about our problem here, we want to first think about, well, let's set up your hoe and your ha, your null and your alternative. And you remember that they're both going to have P. Well, we're talking about how many proportions here? One or two. And if you look at our 7%, you see that's your baseline. We're trying to figure out if there's an increase. So if more than, that means that our null should just be 0.07, 7%. Our alternative should be greater than 0.07 to represent that increase. So more than would be greater than. And we have to make sure we define our parameter. So we're going to define that parameter as P. And what does P represent in this problem? Well, P would be, in this case, looks like we're talking about safe water. So I would say the proportion of the true proportion. Well, what, what are we talking about? The true proportion of households in Rockford. which is a city in Michigan, with unsafe water. Now, if you were going to go through and actually perform a test, you'd set up the conditions, your random, independent, your large counts. You'd go through and you'd, uh, you, would, you would go to the one proportion Z test in your calculator, get that P value in Z and interpret it. Now, I know that it's already been set up for you and solved. But let's go ahead and remember how to set that up because I, I want to make sure we can use our calculator here. So I want you to hit that stat menu and go over to tests. And this is going to be a one prop Z test, one proportion Z test. Now our null is 0.07. Out of your uh, 100 households that were sampled, 12 had unsafe water. So this is 12 out of 100. And we're trying to test to see if that has increased. So we're going to go to greater than. And I'm going to go over here and do a, I'm going to do the draw. And we'll kind of get a normal curve picture here. And assuming the null is true, so assuming it's centered at 7%, there is about a 2.5% likelihood of getting a value at Z or more extreme. Well, 2.5%, 0.025. And letter A right here says, after conducting a, so conducting a significance test, a P value a 0.025 is found, interpret this value. So remember that a p-value is, if we were to uh, assume the null is true, if that is actually true, the likelihood of getting a sample out here uh, or more is is 2.5%. So how do I word that? Well, let's see, assuming The null is true. So what does it mean, the null being true? Assuming the actual proportion of homes with unsafe water 
is 0.07, the likelihood of getting a sample uh, of, of at, what is it? What was it? 12 out of uh, 100. So at P hat, equals 0.12, right? 12 out of 100 is 0 .0, 0 0.12. Uh, the likelihood of getting a sample at p hat equals 0.12 um, or more or greater is, what is our p value? Our p value is 0 0.025. And of course, that is with taking samples of 100. So if we're, this is only talking about samples of 100, taking many, many samples of 100 homes. So again, that's what the p-value represents. The actual, so the, the likelihood of getting a sample way out here, if this is the actual true proportion. In this case here with our sample size of 100, that is what our p-value is. That's how you interpret it. So now let's talk about rejecting or failing to reject HO. Well, if we have our alpha level set to 5%, what are we gonna do here? Do we reject it or do we fail to reject HO? In this case here, well, we're gonna reject the HO. We're gonna reject the HO because the null is low. So or, or so when, when the P is low, reject the HO, right? So we're gonna say because the p value of 0 0.025 is less than our alpha. We reject the null. We have convincing evidence that the uh, percent of safe homes is higher, right? So because the p value of 0 0.025 is less than alpha, we reject the HO. So now, since we're going to reject it, this is, says keep or Keep the current water or switch to bottled water. Well, what should we do in this scenario? If we reject it, that means the water is unsafe, right? Which means what should we do? We should do bottled water, all right? In this case here, since I rejected the null hypothesis, I reject the fact that the water is safe. I want to switch, okay? We should switch to bottled water. Now I want you to pause the video for a moment. The question says, let's suppose the decision is wrong. Let's suppose maybe I make a mistake, okay? Um, maybe I ran my numbers wrong or my, my testing was faulty. And uh, let's talk about some of the consequences you could think, right? So what would, what would be some problems here if this is wrong, okay? Well, let's see if if this is a wrong decision, right? And I've gone I've gone through the whole process of switching the bottle of water. Well, one thing that happens is maybe I wasted money, right? Maybe Rockford could spend a lot of time, resources, and money on something that's not really necessary. So Rockford uh, spends time, money. And just the 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 hoops to jump through um, and other resources, I guess I'll say. Um, uh, when they did not need to. Okay, let's let's talk about that again. So if this was a wrong decision, okay, we made the wrong decision, we rejected the null, but the null is actually true. Okay, the water's safe. The consequence here would be, well, we spend too much time, money, and other resources when we didn't need to. We we provided bottled water to all these people when it wasn't necessary. Okay. Now, if the water is safe, if the water is safe, what's the probability that this error would occur? Okay. If the water is safe, so if I rejected the null, but the null was actually true, the likelihood of that error occurring is actually the same as your alpha. 
So when we set our alpha level, I want you to think about it like this, okay? Um, hold on a second here. All right, I had to draw a little picture for you to kind of get my point across, okay? If the null is true, okay? Again, when we're running a hypothesis test, if the null is true, then the likelihood of, of us rejecting the null hypothesis is going to be out here, right? I'm going to reject the null hypothesis when my when my p-value is five less than 5%. Now, what happens is, if this is true, if true, the likelihood of me erroneously picking my, uh, you know, uh, the likelihood of me getting something out here is 5%. So if I make the decision, I'm going to reject the null, when in fact that's true, then the likelihood of me making that error is also 5%. We call that a type 1 error, okay? This is a type 1 error. I'm going to write this out here, and you should too. All right, a type 1 error. Type one error is when the null is true, but you reject it, okay? So if you reject the null when the null is true, that's called a type one error. That's the, that's the more common error you probably come across, okay? When we reject the null when the null is true, type one error. Now that's gonna be the same probability of getting that error as whatever your alpha set to. So if my alpha set to 1%, all right, well, the likelihood of me making this error is only 1%, but I may not reject it as much, or there may be some there may be some consequences of me setting it too low in this scenario. So it's kind of a little game we play. And we decide, oh, what should I set my, my alpha to? And we have to decide what error is gonna be more, more important or less, uh, less, problematic if I make it. There's other types of error as well. All right, go to the next page here. All right, next page here, page 26. This is going to be question number three. Now, suppose that p-value was higher. So we got, a, we got a different set of numbers, and we got a p-value of 0.217. In this case here, we would, re, uh, we would fail to reject the null because you know 0.217 is greater than your alpha of 0.05. So in this scenario here, if I fail to reject, remember that rejecting the null means that I should switch to bottled water. So if I fail to reject the null, what are we gonna do? Well, failing to reject means we don't have enough evidence that the water is unsafe. Right, So if we don't have enough evidence that the water is unsafe, we fail to reject it, which means that we're going to keep we're going to keep the water we have. Why go why go through all the hoops and, and, and spend extra money and resources on something we don't need? OK, that's failing to reject the null in this scenario because that's our P value is just too big. It's bigger than our alpha that's set. Now, suppose this decision of, is wrong. OK, if we make this decision wrong, we say, all right, water safe. Good to drink the water. What could be a consequence of this air? Uh, what would be a good comfort? Well, for starters, you got people drinking water that uh, that you know we've deemed safe when it's actually not. Okay, so I would just say people are drinking water. That the city said was safe. But guess what? It's not. But it's not safe. Well, that's probably a big problem, right? Right? People could die. People could get sick. Illnesses could occur. A death could occur. Okay? We could have lots of different things happen because of something like this. So in our scenario, okay, would you rather have the city err on the side of caution and give out bottled water or should we just kind of brush it off to the side and say, you know what, uh, water's safe. You know, we've got a, we got our p-values really high. So which consequence do you think is more serious? 
Well, you can make the argument for other one. Maybe if you're an economics person, well, we should save money. The city should save money. You know, I don't, you know, people should be, uh, you know, look out for themselves as far as water is concerned. You know, they can get their own bottled water if they really feel the water is safe. Or you could be of the mindset that, no, we should not, uh, as, a, as a municipality, we should be providing safe water for all citizens. And whatever mindset you are, remember you're you're just running the numbers. You're you're not making the decisions for this. So you're you're reporting um, this p value here, and you're saying, all right, we've de we've determined that the water is safe. You're not the ones making this decision. City leaders are. So in this in, in this scenario, which one do you think is going to be more serious? I would argue that. Uh, Probably question three, okay? I would say uh, drinking unsafe water. Uh, is 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 definitely more serious because you know we're talking about people's healths here, okay? That that's more important than money, okay? Dollars and cents don't always matter. So I'm not going to get into more of the writing on. I just want you to understand what you know. You're going to have to think about the consequences of these type of errors. So I would say drinking unsafe water could lead to significant health problems. Drinking unsafe water could lead to significant health problems. Uh, which is more serious. than uh, spending a little extra money you know, on plastic bottles. Okay, so that's my that's my take on it. You can decide how you want to do it, but that's 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 kind of what my explanation would be. Okay, drinking unsafe water is going to lead to significant health problems. Um, I would argue that's a more serious error to make. Now, what kind of an error is this? Okay, well, this is called a type two error. Okay, so a type one error. Let's re let's remind the viewers what a type one error is. We when we read when the null is true, but we reject it. Okay, so we reject the null when it's actually true. A type two error is the opposite. Okay. A type two error is when he failed to, I'm going to write a little two there because they go together, fail to reject the null. When the null is not true. So I'm just kind of reversing it, right? A type two error is when I fail to reject the null when the null is not true. In other words, I determined that the null, I can't, I can't disprove the null, but it's actually that it's not true. And that's called a type two error. So in this case here, this was a type two error. In this case, this was a type one error, okay? Now, the seriousness of the error depends upon all the questions, okay? Each question will have its own scenario, and you have to determine what's going to be more serious, okay? But for right now, let's talk about a thing called power, okay? Uh, uh, regardless of the type of error you get, um, power in a, st uh, in a statistical test is is what we're going for. We want a test that, that, can, um, that can be reliable. That that has that can provide strong evidence, and what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to on your notes uh, open up the the Bitly that's right here. I'm going to pull that up here, and I want to walk you through some of the um, the the slider so we can understand what that means. Let me pause this for a second. On the handout, if you click over the Bitly Power Stats, it's going to bring you to this little applet. And you don't have to worry about how power is calculated. That is beyond our scope of what we need to learn. We just have to worry about what happens when I increase things like the sample size or the distance between the null and the alternative values. So let's start with a sample size for a minute, okay? Let's assume our standard deviation here is one, our mean is zero. I'm just gonna stick with the normal model and not deal with anything else from now. 
And let's take let's look at my power, my default power that's set. Okay, looks like I'm gonna I'm gonna reset this to make sure what we know uh, what uh, what we have here. All right. Now notice that that power is about 25.9 percent. In other words, it's a, it's a 25.9 percent powerful test. Doesn't seem too powerful, but if we increase that sample size, let's make it um, we'll make it 20. See what happens, and we'll click update. Notice that power went from 25% to 40%. So just like that, it almost doubled, right? Or, well, not quite doubled, but it went up it, it went up pretty significant. And if I go up again, maybe go to 30, you can see that went up to 53%. And the higher that sample size, you know, like we've always said, the, the bigger the sample, the more um, uh, accurate your data is going to be. So, you know, if I included like 100 in there and clicked update, that test becomes very powerful, 93.5% powerful. And don't worry about the calculations on that right now. Just understand that the sample size, uh, an increase in the sample size is going to result in a more powerful test, as you should probably intuitively be aware of, right? So when I'm talking about, well, how can I, how can I increase the power? One thing you can do is increase the sample size. That's a no-brainer. Always increase that sample size if you can, right? Just make sure you don't hit up that 10% limit in your population. Um, now let's talk about the uh, significance level, all right? Let's look at our alpha for a minute. Now, if my alpha is 5% and I increase that, look at my power, look at my power. You do the same thing. If I increase my alpha to 10% or, uh, let's see, what, 5% to... Uh, smaller it looks like it's going smaller over here notice that that alpha level went smaller okay that's going to be at uh, 0.02 what happened to my power look at my power here 0 0.935 0 0.866 the lower i make the alpha then i'm i'm less likely to reject the null hypothesis right so that test might not be as powerful if my alpha is 20 percent then i'm I'm usually going to reject the null hypothesis, right? It's going to be a very powerful test. But again, we we want to we don't want to always reject the null. There's going to be some scenarios where we want to have strong evidence. And if you set your alpha level so high, yeah, it's going to be a powerful test, but is it going to mean much, right? So uh, the power level, if I I can increase that power level if I increase the alpha, right? If I increase the significance level, look at that. If I increase the significance level, that power level is also going to increase. So let's go back over there and, and say that also. If I increase the significance level, so in other words, if it goes up, then that uh, that power is also going to increase. Increase. Now let's talk about the distance between the null and the true alternative. So in this scenario here. My null is just set at zero. Okay. Now, if I look at my alternative hypothesis, you know, I'm trying to um, I'm trying to prove that that it's actually something in this case here greater than zero. Well, if I make this distance even further apart, so let's say it's uh, 0.4, and I update that. Look at the power there, right? Let me start at like 0.1. Now, if my distance is 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 not far away from the null, what's going to happen is, you know, that's not going to be as powerful of a test because I'm going to just think about here on a, on a on a drawing. Just think about this picture that I drew. Okay, if I, if I have this little sampling distribution around my null hypothesis here and here, and I and I and and my in this scenario, my actual sample is way out here versus this one. Which one's going to be a more powerful test? Well, the one where they're further apart, that's going to be more powerful, right? I'm going to have I'm going to have a higher, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to yield better results in this scenario. So when my when my my parameter is actually farther away from the null, so let's say it's like 0.5, and I update that. Look at how powerful the test is. All right, here's my here's my uh, my null over here, and my 0.5 is way over here. Or if I do 0.6. I think that's practically 100%. So the further away my actual value is from the null, um, the uh, 
the, the test will become more powerful. So in, in all three scenarios, okay, if I increase the sample size, if I increase the significance level, increase the significance level, and if I increase the distance between the, the actual and what our null hypothesis is, all three of those are going to result in a more powerful test. Now, how do you calculate the power? Not necessary to know, but I want you to know that that's kind of the, the, the idea of what power means. All right, go to the next page and we'll just kind of touch on some of those important ideas. On page 27, you'll find this table here talking about a, a conclusions template based on the truth of the population. So let's talk about our null and our alternative and our reject and your fail to reject. And let's look at this table here, okay? Now, if the null is true, but you reject it, you made an error, right? That's that type one. So when H, when the, when the null is true, but you reject it, that's a type one error, okay? That's equal to your significance level. So whatever your alpha is, that's gonna be the same thing. That's gonna be the probability of getting it. Um, that's, that's what we call a false positive, okay? False alarm, no good. Now, if the null is true and we fail to reject the null, hey, we made the right decision, right? Our p-value is too high, we fail to reject, and, and we're good to go. Now, if the alternative is true and we rejected the null in favor of the alternative, that's correct. Now, there's a little formula for that, okay? Um, there's this thing, uh, you don't have to calculate it, but the probability of a type 2 error is, is always just going to be 1 minus um, the power. So the probability of a type 2 error is 1 subtract the power. And so that power is actually just a calculation of 1 minus the probability of a type two error. Now you don't have to know how to get that and that's beyond our scope as well, but that is the relationship between those two things. So you just gotta know one minus, we call that beta, okay? So if the probability of getting a type one error is alpha, the probability of, uh, the, the probability of a type two error is beta, okay? Um, correct. Uh, the, the other uh, conclusion here, if alpha is true and you fail to reject the null, so you 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 think alpha, you think the null is right, but the alpha, the the alternative is true, then you've made what's called a type two error. And I like to say here, um, a type a, a type two error is when you fail to fail to reject the null. So it's, it's got that little two in there. when the alternative is true. In other words, when HO is not true. Okay, so you fail to reject the null when the, when the null is not true. That is a type two error. So that little table is gonna help you determine what type of error is. You will have to make conclusions. So you're gonna have to make conclusions based on that information, okay? Now let's talk about uh, just in general, the type of errors you have, uh, a type one error is we reject the null when, when the null is true. A type two error is, is the same thing as we call beta, the probability of, of, of it's one minus the power. And it's when we fail to reject the null when, when the null is false, when the null is not true, or when the alternative is true. And you'll wanna interpret those in context of the problem. And then real quickly on the bottom here, we're just talking about power. Um, the power of test will always be greater um, if the sample size increases, your alpha increases, the true parameter is farther from the null. And the, the lesson didn't go over it, but if the standard error decreases, so if your standard error decreases, um, you have a smaller standard deviation, that's also gonna be more powerful as well, okay? And there's a little bit more over here you can read through, I won't go into it right now. So I want you guys to pause the video and do the check your understanding. And we will go over these questions here after you've paused it. Okay, let's read through this problem. Mr. Weiser purchased a trick coin that is supposed to land heads up 75% of the time. A student volunteers to test this claim. The student flips 50 times, finds that the coin lands heads up 35 times. The student then performs a test of the following hypothesis. And look at your alpha level, it's 10%. Um, here are your hypotheses. Um, the hypothesis, the null is the probability. No, the 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 coin uh, is 
is going to land heads up 75% of the time, whereas the alternative, the coin lands heads up less than 75% of the time. And if you look at your, your raw data here, we have 35 out of 50. Now, if you divide those out, you're going to see, well, yeah, that's 70%. That is less than 75%. But is it statistically significant? Well, that's what, that's what our whole uh, test is for. But let's talk about the errors first, okay? You're asked to describe a type 1 and type 2 error in the setting. And this is a classic problem where you're going to be asked to, in context of the problem, describe what a type 1 and type 2 error is. So a type 1 error is when we reject the null when the null is true. In this scenario, we're going to find evidence that the coin is not working, okay? So we've, you know, if, if I'm rejecting the null, I have strong evidence to conclude the alternative is true. So I have evidence that the coin is not working, that the probability is actually less than 75% of heads when it really does, okay? That's a type 1 error. A type 2 error is when we fail to reject the null when the null is false or when the alternative is true. In that scenario, we do not find any evidence that the coin doesn't work, but it really doesn't work, okay? So we, we can't prove it doesn't work, but we're told it doesn't work, okay? Now, in this scenario, what type of error is going to result in me returning the coin and writing a negative review? Well, I'm going to return the coin if you prove that it doesn't work, and I'm proving it's not working here. I can't prove it doesn't work here. So in that scenario, a type 1 error is the type of error that's going to result in that. Now, look at part C. If a student were to use an alpha 0.05 instead of 0.1, would this make it more or less likely to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true? Well, when we reject the null and the null is true, that's a type 1 error. So the, the likelihood of making a type 1 error is going to decrease because that decreased. Okay, so if, if the alpha level is 10%, I, I'm... I, I would be more likely to reject the null hypothesis here. Well, I'm less likely to reject the null hypothesis here. So my my probability went from 10% to 5% just by increasing decreasing that alpha level. All right, continue working through the check understanding. Pause for number two. I'll have that worked out and try that on your own. Okay, this next question, a statistics major and a finance major decide to get married. In order to investigate that their, that their per person expenses, they select a random sample of guests they have invited to the wedding and record whether or not each person plans to attend the wedding. They decide to test HO equals P or P equals 0 0.75 versus HA, alternative P is not equal to 0 0.75, where P is the true proportion of all guests that will attend the wedding. A, the power of the test to reject the null using alpha 0 0.05 and n equals 25 subjects is 0 0.1. So that's going to be your power. Tells you that in the problem. We want to interpret this value. Power is basically um, the likelihood of making the correct decision. Okay. So in this question, if the true proportion of guests that will attend the wedding is 70%, there is a 10% probability that they will find convincing evidence to correctly reject the null hypothesis that the proportion is 0 0.75. Now that's a mouthful, but interpreting power is not really in our sequence. So that is how it's interpreted, but let's focus on the calculations over here and what happens to the power. Um, so for part B, find the probability of a type 1 error and the probability of a type 2 error for the test in part A. Well, type 1 probability is the same as the alpha level. So if our alpha level is 0 0.05, which is given to you right there, that is literally the probability of a type 1 error. The probability of a type 2 error is always 1 minus power. So if you're given the power, then we remember we call this beta and we call this alpha. The, the, the probability of beta is just 1 minus the power, 1 minus 0.10%, or 0.10. 90%. So the probability of making a type 1 error is 5%. Probability of making a type 2 error is 90%. So let's look at uh, what happens when I play around with the numbers. If I use a smaller alpha level instead of my standard 0.05, what's going to happen to the power? Well, it's going to decrease. Okay, It's going to be harder to reject the null at 0 0.01. There's fewer p-values less than 0 0.01 than there are 0 0.05. So I'm going to have a, a less powerful test as a result. Okay, The power is going to decrease when that goes down. 
Okay, so when this goes down, power goes down as well. Now, what happens if my sample size goes up? So if I have a bigger sample size, my power is going to increase. Okay, since the sample size increases, it's going to be reduced variability. So the likelihood of making the correct decision is going to go up. So when I have a bigger sample size, power goes up. When I, when I have a lower alpha, power goes down. And that's basically all for our notes here. Your assignment is to start on the, uh, the practice uh, test, the, the review materials. So um, you all have a fantastic day. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.